think we're all set. All right. So, so uh, I want to give an overview of uh, phase arrays uh, first, you know, to establish uh, the baseline to make sure everybody understands um, the basic concept. I'll just go over in two slides what a phased array is all about, a brief historical perspective. Uh, the basic architectures, and then some present-day applications. So, the term implies a phased array is an array of elements. These elements can be uh, seed elements, transmit elements, or both. This uh, slide, we have a linear array or a one-dimensional array. However, phased arrays can be in two dimensionals, which is in a grid pattern, or even in three dimensions, as I will uh, show later. In the receive array, we have a wavefront impinging on this, uh, in this case, the uh, one-dimensional array. We, ha we have it impinging at a given angle. So as a result, each element sees the signal coming in at a slightly uh, different time. And there, hence, there's a delay uh, of one element relative to the other. And incorporate phase shifters at each element and that and you use those phase shifters in such a way that you would like to constructively add all of the signals coming in from each of the elements to form a beam. In the transmission, it's the inverse. We set the phases in such a manner that we can steer the wave front at a given angle. Because uh, the array is of finite dimension, in this case, uh, we're not really applying any weights or anything. We have, in effect, a regular windowing function, and as a result, we have a sync function describing the array function, that's AF, that's the overall transfer characteristic of the array. To see what this all looks like, right, if you only have 16 elements, you wind up with a very fat beam, as the elements are spaced a half a wavelength apart. And if you increase the number of elements to 64, you have a much net more narrow beam, as your green curve here. Appropriate phase offsets at each element, you can steer this beam. You can also do other things, such as you'll notice there's knolls in the beam, so you can steer knolls in certain directions, such as where there's interferers. You can also do other things by a combination of phase shifts and weight of the elements, include notches, and do lots of other interesting things. But due to lack of time, I'm not going to get into that. The historic aspect of it. Um, the first known arrays, you know, in the acoustic and uh, RF environments, uh, one is uh, work that was done during World War II, sorry, during World War I by the French. Uh, this is an acoustic array that was developed to sense uh, uh, incoming aircraft as distance. Notice that the, uh, the array was connected to the users uh, via this tube, which hooked up to the user's ear. Uh, there's two or three users of this. I'm not sure if it was uh, like a collective decision as to determine what was happening or if they were looking or listening for different sounds. Uh, also, uh, uh, Jean Brown went on to uh, win a Nobel Prize. I'm not sure if it was for this work, but see there was another parallel in that respect later. Uh, this picture right has gotten a lot of mileage amongst array fans. Uh, this is otherwise known as an imperial war tube, as a slang expression. Uh, again, large horns out to listen for incoming aircraft. Uh, not clear what the context of this photo was. Uh, you'll notice on the right, uh, artillery. So if, in fact, the function of the two are tied together, this is a very early example of an array involved in fire control. On the other, it might just be some exhibition and uh, uh, people bring this stuff out and showing it. If anybody has any information on these pictures, I'd certainly like to know about it. Another array, uh, this was during World War II. Uh, this was the ground uh, control approach radar. Uh, basically, it was two arrays uh, operating at uh, about 10 gigahertz. Uh, an azimuth array and an elevation array. So what would happen is uh, pilots would, uh, you know, bear, aim their planes uh, toward a runway. The, the big problem was any of the uh, uh, airstrips uh, throughout Great Britain, they were often fogged in, the storms are really bad, and, they just, and the pilots just couldn't see where they were going. So with this precision uh, ground um, control uh, radar, 
an operator would radio to the pilots telling them what to do to guide them in. And Arthur Clark of 2001 was uh, a, a technician for the Royal Air Force at the time, and he was involved in these systems, and he wrote a novel about it and talking about how it was used, and uh, that book is still available. By the way, this was developed uh, by the MIT um, Radiation Lab and then shipped to England as first as a prototype and then they deployed them at many airstrips. Here we have the SPY-1 radar. This is operating at about 3 gigahertz S-band. Um, you have uh, four to 5,000 elements in each of these arrays. Uh, this has gone through many different generations and employed on many uh, ships, uh, even outside the U.S. Another interesting array uh, is from the CEA Technologies Company of Australia. Their objective was to keep the cost of arrays down since they were on a much more limited budget. And as a result, they went to uh, use of uh, commercial off-the-shelf pa uh, parts, especially FPGAs, uh, you know, data inverters, processors, and so on. And as a result, they had uh, created what is perhaps the first operational all-digital radar. And, and I'll go in, in a few slides, I'll explain what that means. It's a very advanced radar, especially given its cost and very successful. The largest arrays ever deployed is the FPX, uh, sea-based expert radar. It's out in the Pacific on effectively what is an oil rig. They, they move it around uh, to watch for missiles. Uh, but uh, its size will be superseded soon by space fence that's being uh, constructed in the Islands. It has 6,000 transmit elements and 86,000 receive elements. And its purpose is intended to look at space junk. It will uh, categorize and it will make an inventory of thousands and thousands of uh, items in uh, considered space junk, and this will come online in 2018. It's nevertheless quite powerful, used in the battlefield or to watch for missiles and, uh, and so on. And of course, the arrays can be uh, condensed in size uh, to fit into the nose cone of a jet fighter many different types of arrays along those lines that are extremely advanced. Basic array is a bunch of antel elements. They could be transmitter, receiver, both. Traditionally, <coughs> excuse me, they would uh, each have their own ferrite phase shifter, and then uh, in, in the coming signals would be simply added up or combined, sent through LNA and a, a receiver. Uh, on the side, similar thing, the signal broken up, sent shifters, and then out to the element. So th this is sort of like the spawn architecture, um, and it could repeat, you know, across the array. You necessarily have just one transformer. You can have several. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, active electronically steer arrays, especially for the jet fighters, came along. Uh, here you have a separate TR module. Uh, we're able to do this because of advancements in electronics, such as in gallium arsenide uh, components. Um, so you, you break the array into groups of modules, uh, assign a, an analog beamformer to them, and there you, in the back end you can go through uh, you know, digital processing um, you know, types of signal processing chains, both for the receive and for the transmit. Considerable interest nowadays in elemental digital arrays. So here you have the separate TR modules for each element, but now each module has their own uh, receiver uh, and data converters and uh, some synthesizers and some level of signal processing. And then the beams all get uh, combined in a digital sense. And this is carried out, you know, through GAs, A6, perhaps GPUs and other means. It's basically systolic type processing. Uh, very repetitive, you know, just running a, a bit stream through these algorithms to perform the beam forming, both in the transmit and receive sense. IMO now, especially for 5G, MIMO you consider as a special case of the elemental digital case, uh, where here the MIMO blocks are responsible for generating waveforms and receiving the waveforms and processing them uh, so that you uh, will less sort out the different bit streams going to uh, each user who, in effect, are assigned uh, a given beam. 
So one would laugh or be highly critical of the notion of doing an elemental digital array simply because the analog to digital converters were very expensive, very power consuming, took up space, and you know, they just weren't designed for it. That's all changed in the last couple of years. If you look at this curve, this is more or less a measure of the amount of power consumed uh, a given, uh, say, data rate. And here, you know, you can see that uh, we are now well into the, you know, gigasample per second realm with power headed down as we look in down, you know, rightward and downward direction. And these are all recent uh, accomplishments in the analog to digital conversion field. Uh, getting into this territory is making all the arrays feasible. So the realistic possibility and it's now being pursued on a number of fronts. Uh, uh, work in a program from DARPA called Arrays at Commercial Timescales, otherwise known as ACT. So uh, the idea is to take some of the concepts I just talked about, uh, and you have these, you know, traditionally these enormous arrays, you know, with you know, perhaps hundreds of meters of cabling, cabinets and cabinets and racks and racks of processing equipment. The idea is to condense that all down into a circuit module that fits right behind the array face, and that would contain ADD converters, signal processing elements, and so on. So uh, this is happening, again, uh, not just the DARPA, but a lot of groups are looking at this. And the arrays can take on different uh, shapes and uh, dimensions. Uh, you can have them in a conformal sense, such as on a, you know, shaped uh, to the shape of a wing. You don't necessarily have to populate all the positions in the array either. Uh, maybe for cost or for physical reasons, you can't uh, put an, a radiating element in every place. Or maybe the radiating elements die and and you have to have a means of compensating. And you can do that with uh, digital arrays uh, through you know, various numerical means. Uh, this work was done by uh, the University of Trento. And by the way, there is, there is an article about it in the proceedings that was referred to. So I'll quickly go over some prime day applications. I'll start with uh, radio astronomy. There's a lot of work going on in this area, such as with 